Without further ado, I'd like to uh, introduce our opening keynote speaker, Dr. Paul Fife, Assistant Professor of English at North Carolina State University. A uh, full biography of Dr. Fife uh, appears on page 12 of your program. So I will now turn the program over to him in what I am sure will be a stimulating presentation on the scale of digital pedagogy. Dr. Fife. Thanks to uh, everyone for coming out this morning, um, and to Lee Bonds and the Friedman Center for inviting me, and to our august panel of judges um, sitting over here. Um, I couldn't resist the invitation, uh, not least because I was actually born in Cleveland in a hospital not far from here. <clears throat> My parents met at Case, uh, Case Western Med School. We lived only a few miles east of the campus, and the city has stayed with me if only in the form of my tribal name for the father and son YMCA scouting group I've joined with my first grader. It was an auspicious sign to be born under. Saving reminiscence for later, let's talk digital pedagogy. Here we are in 2014, or as my colleague describes it, the year after the year after the year of the MOOC. <laughs> that was, of course, how the New York Times described, among others, 2012, whose fast developing events, I'm sure, are well known to us all, but it's weird looking back on this. I mean, what the hell is going on with that chainsaw? Do you see this? <laughs> anyway, disruption? OK. Suffice to say that in the year after the year after that year, the hype has died down a bit from the massive attention to the masses of universities flocking to massive online education. We've learned much about the operation and the problems of this model in the meantime. That won't be my concern today, but instead, I risk bringing up the worst academic acronym of all time to mark one endpoint on a spectrum, the scale on which we engage with students and which they engage with each other or with broader publics. We might mark the other end of that scale with another edu buzzword, and one which I've only recently encountered, though perhaps you're more familiar with it, sequestered learning. This is apparently what we used to call the classroom, <laughs> as if protectively cloistering our students from the sins of the world and now also the web. Rebranding this as sequestered learning surely responds to how teachers are now frequently opening their classrooms to outside contact. So here's the distinction. You can have a face-to-face, -face, even a small classroom, thoroughly connected to the open web. You can also sequester that environment in a walled garden like an LMS, or simply by asking students to close their laptops, in which attention is prayer. The subfield of digital pedagogy, as it's become known, thinks about teaching and learning practices along this entire spectrum. It is a fallacy, even a grievous error, to associate digital pedagogy solely with MOOCs or with distance education. Because even on the other end of the scale, digital pedagogy can crucially affect sequestered learning environments, even including those, as I've argued elsewhere, which close laptops or dispense with computers entirely. Still, I think that most of us fall somewhere in the middle. We see the opportunities for developing practices in digital pedagogy which integrate the unique affordances of different learning environments, small to large, sequestered to open. Now, if you hear blended learning in this, I'm trying very hard not to say that for reasons that I'll explain later. Today, I want to share some examples of experiments in this interesting middle ground and think along with you about the opportunities and outcomes of these models of mid-sized digital pedagogy. In particular, we'll take a look at what's been variously called connected classrooms, cross-campus learning environments, or even small private online courses, or SPOCs. Yes, SPOCs, just when you thought the acronyms couldn't get any worse. I'm tempted to call this acronymic reflex the requisite acronym for learning formations, or RALF. <laughs> In any case, these mid-sized experiments virtually combine classes at separate universities, blending their on-site meetings with online conversations and collaborative work. 
I'm trying out such an experiment this semester with Richard Menke, a, college from the University of, uh, a colleague from the University of Georgia, sharing a module at this moment on David Copperfield between my class on reading in the digital age and his class on the history and theory of the novel. By the way, hello, students. They told me that they wanted to watch. Also, hi, mom. OK. So in various ways, the examples I'll share all take advantage of the possibilities of extending our classrooms while also strategically limiting their scope, involving multiple rosters of students without becoming massive. I've been thinking of this in Michael Whitmore's terms, seeing the classroom as massively addressable, a context in which we can configure learning experiences at a variety of scales for different goals. Now, there are a range of interesting models for how we might do this, what we might learn from each, and, and asking why the instructors tried it, how it worked, and how they judged its successes. So I'm going to run down in this talk several reasons, interconnected reasons, why you might be interested to try it. Why try connecting courses? First of all, because your very subject might demand it, especially if you teach Walt Whitman. Unscrew the locks from the classroom doors. Unscrew the classroom doors themselves from the jams. This was the mantra of the Looking for Whitman project, orchestrated by Matt Gold, Karen Carbinier, Jim Groom, and others in the fall semester of 2009, who connected their various courses at their very different universities. Whitman testified, I am large. I contain multitudes. And this teaching experiment was multitudinous rather than massive. Each course studied the unique facets of Whitman based on their own locations, New York, Brooklyn, New Jersey, Fredericksburg, and Washington, DC. As Matt Gold summarizes, the project asked students to research Whitman's connections to their individual locations and to share that research with one another in a dynamic, social, web-based learning environment. Courses met face-to-face while using web aggregators on blogs and social media to share insights, responses, and to foster a project-wide community. Each course had its own learning goals and differently skilled students with different curricular backgrounds. But as the instructors report, the course bridged institutional divides and ennobled the distributed contributions of its varied participants. As Whitman would have appreciated, the courses collected into a community without losing their distinctiveness in the mass. Now, this shared model of synchronous teaching is also happening in the sciences. As Tom Gleason recently reports in Inside Higher Ed, he co-taught a graduate class in advanced groundwater hydrology in a course compassing McGill University, the University of Saskatchewan, and the University of Wisconsin. This Spock was as determinedly private as looking for Whitman was open, but it likewise flourished because of the real-time sharing among its participants. As Gleason reports, the experiment's major success was exposing students to topics, tools, and skills they otherwise wouldn't have encountered in their individual classes. So, second major reason for trying this out, to ennoble and build upon student work. Consider the Victorian Poetry Wiki, organized by my friend Alison Chapman at the University of Victoria. Chapman, like perhaps many of us, wondered why, every semester, we wipe the slate clean of student work on subjects that will be taught again and again. Why not ask students to benefit from the work of their predecessors and build on it further? While still a work in progress, the Victorian Poetry, Poetics, and Context Wiki endeavors to do just this, offering a lateral model of contiguous collaboration among different classes, not only at the University of Victoria, but anywhere a Victorian poetry course might be interested to engage with the project. So far, it has included the University of Exeter, Whittier College, the University of Toledo, and Hobart and Smith from summer 2012 and continuing to the present. Third reason to connect courses. If your goal is student engagement, in two related senses, during class as well as beyond the semester. 
My colleague in forestry at NC State University, George Hess, has published on his experiment with collaborative graduate education across multiple campuses, in which three different courses, each focused on a single guiding question. Where is conservation science in local planning? Hess et al. wanted an inquiry-based learning experience keyed to critical problems in natural resources and civic planning that not only produced lively student engagement with timely problems, it trained students in the very collaborative context in which such problems are tackled professionally. As Hess and others explain, multi-institutional approaches to graduate education continue to emerge as a way to better prepare students for collaborative work. Such coordinated efforts, again at a scale which expands the student art participants but limits the cohort to a focused community, thus anticipate the distributed, professionally focused environments for research which characterize our disciplines and our postgraduate work. Look around at what's new and exciting in digital pedagogy and you'll probably find Brian Croxall, one of last year's speakers at this very colloquium. In fall 2011, and reprised again in the last spring semester, Croxall organized a group of instructors including Mark Sample, Zach Whalen, Aaron Templeton, and Paul Benzen, all from different institutions, to share a collaborative module on Mark Daniel Lusky's postmodern novel, House of Leaves. When it was published, fans of House of Leaves flocked to an online forum to try and collectively grapple with the novel's uh, formidable enigmas and difficulty. It was, as Mark Sample points out, a networked novel from the start, and therefore begs to be studied as part of a network of readers. Like looking for Whitman, the subject matter here invites us to join a network of collaborative interpretation grappling with a project that was bigger than any of these classes could do by themselves. As Croxall explains in a recent interview, his goal was also student engagement, harnessing the energies of sharing that Mark Sample has claimed lie at the heart of the digital humanities. For Croxall, as for so many of these teachers, sharing is a tool for introducing students to the broader interpretive communities they are always a part of. In other words, we're not alone reading this crazy novel because my crazy professor assigned it. Or even, we're not just academic majors following a designated curricular path in the walled gardens of higher ed. Instead, you are part of a mutually and responsible creative community, and that community wants your help. This kind of engagement can have political valences, too. In their recent essay, The Other End of the Scale, William Thomas and Elizabeth Lorang of the University of Nebraska at Lincoln urged digital pedagogy to focus on more specific communities, particularly those underserved or flatly overlooked by the promoters of massive education or enterprise learning solutions. Thomas and Lorang offer instead the example of History Harvest an open digital archive of historical artifacts gathered from communities across the US. Specific courses at UNL and teams of students work with community partners interested to digitize, archive, and share their historical materials, from documents and objects to stories and oral histories. For students, this offers a practicum in the workflows and platforms of digital history, as well as a crucial sensitivity to the political consequences of this work at any scale. As Thomas and Lorang suggest, the present foregrounding of abundance and connectivity has emphasized volume and scale. The danger in this view of abundance, whether of rich data or of ubiquitous access, is a false sense of completeness and equality. Importantly, I think history harvest is not crowdsourced so much as course sourced and place based, urging similar harvests and bridging digital learning with local impact. Fourth reason, because of what you might call the unbearable lightness of being connected. 
In digital pedagogy circles and beyond, teachers have taken advantage of the opportunity for openly sharing course materials, moving from walled gardens to course blogs on the open web, and inviting their students to practice their learning in the open. Among the many justifications for doing so is students sometimes direct, strikingly direct contact with the world online. For example, when Margaret Atwood tweets back to the students in your writing class, as in this case, Amanda LeCastro's current first year writing course at NYU called Thinking and Writing Through New Media. Or when the author of the critical essay you've assigned students to review responds to their blog posts in the comments. <laughs> here in Miriam Posner's DH101 class at UCLA. Or when the author of Remediation retweets your tweet about the remediated version of their book Remediation, which you're using in class. <clears throat> Perhaps you have your own examples. At the same time, these interactions are not always the rule. The open web can yawn with roaring silence. The hoped for spontaneous interactions and serendipitous connections dissipate amid the th constant thrum of spam and nanity and trolls. As Croxel said, we like to talk about blogging like our students are communicating the world, and that was kind of true in 2004. Now it doesn't always happen unless students or teachers amplify those signals to their own worlds. In the example I've just showed, in fact, Miriam Posner has prearranged with selected authors from her syllabus to check in on her students' blogging, which is still great. And it points, importantly, I think, to a need to reorient ourselves on scales of sustainable interactions or finding firmer pedagogical footing amid the vertigo of the open web. Now, doing this means developing structures for and orchestrating interactions with a larger community, but one that we actively work to define. I've always been skeptical of ways that MOOCs, for example, rhetorically presume these self-forming groups and spontaneous flash collaborations among their users, or what you could call stochastic organization, or even from a more skeptical point of view, disavowing responsibility to even structure learning environments, i.e. disrupting education. But serendipity can happen at scale. Matt Gold reports that there were some surprising student connections, st student projects in looking for Whitman, including unasked for learning resources, which students just created for each other. I share Gold's sense that we should allow for this kind of development without counting on it. In other words, design a learning environment which does not presume self-organization but allows for serendipity. And to their credit, several MOOCs even have developed in this way. For example, the History and Future of Higher Education course orchestrated by Kathy Davidson and others operated on several scales at once a general aggregation stream for everyone, three synchronous and connected face-to-face -face courses at different universities, and a Coursera-based MOOC for self-registering participants around the world. Fifth reason to do this, because we need to steer the disruption in higher ed. Among the most critically incisive of these experiments has been organized by the FemTechNet Collective, a collaboration of scholars across the country, they also devised a supporting course explicitly called a Distributed Open Collaborative Course, or DOCC, or DOC. The DOC is a hybrid, connecting face-to-face -face courses while also remaining open to the broader online community. First run in 2013 by Lisa Nakamura, Liz Lash, Anne Bosalmo, and Veronica Paredes, the DOC is at once a collaborative experiment in transformative pedagogy and a feminist critique of MOOCs. Instead, the super course entitled Dialogues on Feminism and Technology emphasizes the participatory conditions of knowledge making in distributed fears by a variety of social actors. The DOC connects networked and physical spaces and academic and everyday life and includes its site-specific courses as nodes in a distributed network. 
The dock does not aim to be massive, but to cultivate a critical mass around its topic. So there are lots of reasons for and lots of models of mid-sizing digital pedagogy. In fact, you can even take a course on connected courses to learn more about designing your own experiment with the right degrees of size, structure, and openness. And it sounds like I'm shilling for that. I'm in no way connected with this. Um, but in the last section of this talk, I want to ask some questions about why we would want to. I've shared several reasons for trying connected courses, but maybe there's something missing. Can we say, try this because it works? Try this because we know it helps students? Unless I have been massively wasting your time, that claim has been implicit throughout, but can we prove it? At the close, I want to talk about scale in a different sense, as context and as a tool for measurement. I have a growing suspicion that all our energies as innovators in digital pedagogy don't have the traction that they really should. Recall again that scale-tipping insanity of the year of the MOOC. Why the headlong administrative rush to adopt them, when beyond some overheated editorials about disruption, we had no proof that they worked, or even paid out for that matter? Now we have proof that for many students, MOOCs practically don't. So, maybe we should try a different model and a better acronym. <laughs> maybe we scale down from massive to midsize, community-based or distributed. But how do we really know we're doing better? This came home to me last summer in a seminar run by my university's Office for Faculty Development. The seminar was on SOTL, or the Scholarship for Teaching and Learning, which was entirely new to me at the time and was basically a way for good teachers in STEM to get professional credit for the very hard work they did in innovating, studying, and sharing their teaching methods. From the start, I was stunned at the immediate and outright dismissal of course evaluations. Particularly for my STEM colleagues, whatever course evaluations do, they completely fail to measure student learning. Now, good research is out there on the shortcomings and even detriments of course evaluations, which, at best, only report student perceptions. <clears throat> if we want to assess student learning, we need other measures. Now, SOTL derives from social science measures, which privilege quantitative and less so qualitative data harvested from various kinds of assessment instruments, from tests to focus groups to surveys and so on. But as a literature professor, as a digital humanist devoted to what Katherine Harris characterizes as a pedagogy of screwing around, I struggled to approach my own teaching as having measurable outcomes, and hence becoming something I could track if I were to change tactics. But I also became convinced this might be worth trying, and here's why. On the first day of that seminar, the room was bubbling with excitement over a recently published paper in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. This paper definitively proved with chart after chart that active learning increases student performance in science, engineering, and mathematics. In other words, students learn more from engaging classrooms than from boring lectures. <laughs> High five, y'all. We cracked it. <laughs> How was this news in summer 2014? You may have supposed this claim was self-evident, but there wasn't any evidence. There wasn't any data. There hadn't been a study until now. Energized by these results, my colleagues planned their own active learning and blended learning projects to the point where, during that week, the phrase flipped classroom could have fueled a lively drinking game. And I very nearly succumbed. Active learning is good for students. Why don't we get this kind of credit? Why don't my colleagues, innovations in teaching, especially in digital pedagogy, send interdisciplinary shockwaves through the academy? Shouldn't they? It got me thinking. Within the field of digital pedagogy alone, there are outlets increasingly dedicated to sharing our experiments, successes, and realizations in teaching. 
For example, in CUNY's Journal of Interactive Technology and Pedagogy, along with its brave section of teaching fails. In the online hybrid pedagogy, in the online journal syllabus, and in the generous blogs of teachers all over the web, these are important and welcome. But sharing results and perspectives also raises the questions of how did we get them in the first place? How do we know what we did? And how do we know that digital pedagogy really works? Now, I mean to point no fingers at all, but in my own work, I've unblushingly drawn from student evaluations and self-reported comments about the new and different stuff that we have tried. And anecdotally, I think that's pretty common, at least in English classrooms anyway, as quantitative instruments like tests are typically neither popular nor appropriate. But what scale should we really use? Are there outcomes or objectives or skills or capacities which are measurable? And would we even want to track them? In other words, does the very idea of measurement capitulate to neoliberal managerial regimes, to the educational regimes we're frequently trying to disrupt? Now, I'm no fan of standardized testing, quantitative performance metrics, and assessment plans, which can be unfriendly to creative and critical thinking. Is it a paradox to ask even about measuring them? Walking down the hallways recently at my university, I came across this poster and nearly laughed outlining how we assess our general educational program goals, or GEP. The standards of creativity. It's an oxymoron worth thinking about, though. For digital pedagogies, what are our goals? How do we know if we've met them? And do others trust the very instruments we use to find out? Now, the Looking for Whitman project tried to find out by conducting anonymous surveys, which is an approved SOTL instrument. And this required they take the additional and formidable task of getting approval from all the institutional review boards, or IRBs, at the participating universities. But the project team did get approval, and they have published their survey data. Percentage responding, percentages about specific questions, and qualitative feedback. But all measurements require calibration, and they have no scale for comparison. For instance, what does it mean that 70% of responding students felt they had expert or close to expert knowledge of Whitman and of literature more generally? Can we correlate this with their connected experiences? The article concludes that learning within a networked environment seems to have been strengthened by the course experience. And overall, the course appears to have had a very positive effect on the students who participate in it. Now, let me iterate that I am inspired by Matt Gold, his collaborators, and his students. But these claims may not turn next year's interdisciplinary faculty retreat into a frenzied rave over connected courses. They inspire us, and isn't that enough? In fact, I just learned on Tuesday that one of my current graduate students at NC State participated in the Looking for Whitman experiment while she was a student at the University of Mary Washington. She assured me that it was the most memorable course of her entire college career. Amazed by these experiments, my colleague at UGA and I are also employing research assistants to oversee IRB-approved student surveys and focus groups during our experiment this semester. And I desperately hope that we have such strong claims to make about the project and such compelling testimonies about its effects. But without A-B testing or stable assessment tools, we're still measuring student perceptions. But that may be good enough if we can make a different argument, not about the relative value of student perceptions compared to other assessment metrics, albeit they surveys, tests, etc., but about the absolute value of student perceptions in a certain learning context. Because in the humanities, our outcomes are broadened, critically informed, and engaged perceptions of the world. If this is our goal, we design courses to accomplish it and should similarly design the scale on which to evaluate and communicate our success. Jesse Stommel, incredibly active in pushing critical agendas in digital pedagogy, has recently shared a presentation on exactly this subject. 
how to design assessments with what he calls emergent outcomes. In other words, Stama wants us to take control of assessment and articulate our own measures, fitted not just to the discipline, but the particular goals of any course. Let the pedagogy drive the assessment, he says, not the other way around. Teach, test to the teach, as it were. Rightly skeptical of assessment, Stommel throws out external summative assessment as a last resort. But that's where Sotil, at least, seems to me, could offer a useful corrective. Design any assessment that you want. If you, the instructor, administer it, you're influencing the results. Now, this doesn't have to mean employing third-party research assistants to help study your courses, though it could. It might mean instead looking for the inductive strength of our teaching, how our courses impact students beyond our own boundaries of measurement as teachers, beyond the boundaries of classrooms and our semesters. To adapt Stommel's own terms, how might we assess the emergent impact of our pedagogy in other domains? For instance, my favorite survey question used by the Looking for Whitman project was, how did you describe this class when you were talking to family and friends? Or Brian Croxell asking his students in connected courses to write a letter to future students taking the class. In all his admirable teaching experiments, Croxell wants students, quote, to realize their agency as a transformative possibility and carry that with them throughout their lives or simply just to the next semester. The most successful projects in the Intro to Digital Humanities courses that I've taught have all <coughs> taken shape beyond our appointed term a master's thesis, a research collaboration on a digital archive with other faculty, an alt-act job. Now, these are anecdotes and not data. But can they be? Kathleen Fitzpatrick, now director of scholarly communications at the Modern Language Association, or MLA, has written extensively about changing models of how we evaluate scholarly output. In a blog post on open access publishing and post-publication review, she writes, given that we in the digital humanities excel at both uncovering the network relationships among texts and at interpreting and articulating what those relationships mean, couldn't we bring those skills to bear on creating a more productive form of post-publication review that serves to richly and carefully describe the ongoing impact that a scholar's work is having, regardless of the venue and type of its publication. I think now could be the time to rephrase Fitzpatrick's welcome challenge to the professional imagination in terms of digital pedagogy and its practices. Given that we, in digital pedagogy, excel at cultivating nuanced perspectives on students' involvements with technology and with the digital's impact on culture, couldn't we bring those skills to bear on creating more persuasive forms of learning assessments that serve to document and communicate the ongoing impact of a student's experience? Couldn't we convince pundits why our practices should be the next big thing in higher ed or the next mid-sized thing? I'd like to think so. Thank you. Ali, do we still have some time for questions? Great. Well, I'm happy to uh, uh, talk about this with anyone or, or accept your, uh, your suggestions and your perspectives. Or I could just pick up this mic and drop it. <laughs> Hi, thanks Hi. for your very engaging talk. Um, where, where, where do you begin with this as a model for an institution that doesn't have um, many of these kinds of programs in place? Um, for example, uh, which, which programs in particular were you? Um, I didn't have any particular programs in mind, but um, uh, 
I teach at a, at a, a small startup college, um, you know, cash strapped, and so it's things are very done, done very uh, cowboy, so to speak. <laughs> We're putting things together, sure. and uh, we, where do you start in implementing this? Um, even just as an individual, not institutionally, but individually. Right. Well, there are probably, and I've been beating this metaphor to death, different scales on which you could uh, approach this. Um, one being, you know, just in your classrooms to be quite conscious about ways that you document the things that you do and then share them, um, both in terms of how you succeed and how you fail. Um, uh, my uh, intro to DH courses always start with John Unsworth, a uh, great essay from 1997 called The Importance of Failure, which is about how digital humanities, if it cannot assess how it doesn't work, it does not produce new knowledge. Um, and I think that's a really important point for us to consider, too, in digital humanities pedagogy or digital pedagogy in any kind of case. And it, maybe it starts with us. It uh, starts with us in our classrooms thinking about how do I, how do I know when I've failed? Um, how do I know when I've succeeded and who will trust me when I tell them this? Um, as well as to take advantage of the opportunities of sharing those lessons, regardless of, of you know, your claim for the, the instruments you might use uh, 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 widely. Because um, uh, people will pick them up, too, at different institutions, uh, might want to collaborate with you, um, uh, might amplify the signal, trade back and forth uh, these different assignments, and put it in a very generative uh, and, and visible uh, cycle of kind of collaborative uh, teaching uh, that, that we're already doing all the time. Um, I think the, the second level is more institutional. You know, how do you change the narrative about effective teaching? Um, and generally, this gets to a much bigger can of worms about changing the narrative about the humanities and ways that uh, that, 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 that sort of we are uh, seen and judged um, at our institutions of all different kinds, as well as nationally. Um, just as a, another anecdote, uh, before I was at NC State University, I was at Florida State University, um, where the, uh, um, I put this diplomatically, the, um, uh, the state legislature and, and its administration um, became very interested in what Texas A&M was doing to try to quantify all measures of faculty performance. Um, uh, there was a, a seven-part plan uh, for, for Texas at that moment. Um, our then university president, who's since gone on to Penn State, um, decided that he, he saw this coming down the line and realized he needed to get out ahead of it. So what he did was he presented, you know what, Texas has seven, we will have eight. We will have eight parts to this plan, and then quietly, and also we're gonna figure out what they are before we go and tell them what these eight parts are. But isn't it better? Um, in other words, to sort of define in advance uh, how we wanna be assessed, um, uh, what, are the, what are the measures by which this, this can work? And we need to be in the room. You know, we need to uh, be part of this conversation very broadly. And I think people, people, people are. Um, and, and I hope continue to be. So um, I would say, you know, in your class with your teaching community and, and uh, sort of, you know, vertically in your, in your, uh, in your institution to think about how to, um, how, to, how to validate as well as how to kind of uh, really change the terms by which uh, experimental teaching uh, is, is validated. I can hear you, yes. Okay. And I'll, I'll, I'll repeat your question. So. Okay. Um, my name is Nora Mathis. I'm from the University of Pittsburgh. And I'm interested in, um, I, I, I'm familiar with some of the work that, thank you. Um, so North Carolina State University, I know um, the library system has um, developed some support around digital scholarship. and. Um, at Pitt, at the library, we're looking at ways that we can collaborate to with, with classes. And I'm wondering if, in your experience, you've been working with the library system on some of these collaborative um, you know, uh, courses. Yeah, um, uh, thank you very much um, for that. Uh, have I worked with the library system? I'll say I've, I've tried to work with everybody because uh, I feel like I don't know what I'm doing, and I need help. <laughs> um, and happily, there are um, uh, there are resources for those of us who teach by the seat of our pants, um, including at uh, 
um, my university, uh, a very energetic librarian. So um, uh, though they haven't been specifically part of, of the way that I've rolled out this kind of collaborative module, um, I've uh, 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 really tried to get my classes this semester uh, in there um, in a bunch of different ways um, and have, have reached out to them. Um, um, and uh, we've done some, some, some fun stuff. Uh, for example, um, I don't know if anyone is familiar with the uh, Book Traces project that uh, Andy Stauffer um, has, uh, has organized, a sort of crowdsourced attempt to document uh, marginalia, uh, 19th century marginalia, 19th century circulating collections of books. We did a, a scavenger hunt in D.H. Hill Library, which is the older library uh, that still has a lot of books in it. Um, um, <laughs> and uh, just had a blast. Uh, and it was fascinating to me to hear from our uh, humanities librarian, Cindy Levine, about the institutional history of our collections, uh, for the students to kind of realize some of the institutional histories by which any of these resources are, are, are made present, and then to kind of go around and, you know, really, uh, and I don't mean to, um, this, to, to say this was a, a naive response, but, but to really ooh and ah over over, over the stuff there. The next week we went to the uh, uh, Hunt Library, um, which is quite new um, and totally amazing, like a spaceship just landed on the middle of the campus, um, and looked at the, uh, the book bot, got a behind the scenes tour with librarians there uh, to talk about uh, information spaces, um, different ways of organizing information and things. So um, the library has, for me, been wonderfully responsive in figuring out how to uh, uh, extend the, the, the connections of my own uh, specific course at NC State. Um, and it is crucial for me to, real, to help students realize, uh, all of, help them realize all of the different resources at, at the institution in which they are and, and are invited into, right? Um, in fact, um, um, high graduate students also who are think today headed over to the makerspace uh, in one of the libraries um, to work with a library fellow on creating a steampunk telegraph. I don't know how this is going to work, but I asked this guy and he's like, yeah, we can do that. So, so we're doing it. Um, and I'm not even there. Um, and I send, them, I send them detailed thank you emails. Because uh, uh, I've heard, um, and, and, and you know, I'm among experts here in this, that um, these kinds of uh, interactions with students and with classes are also good for librarians, not just um, out, of their, out, of, out of the warmth of very generous hearts, but also uh, professionally in terms of um, uh, uh, becoming, demonstrating the library's impact uh, and having sort of things to measure, um, including documented um, interactions with classes um, someone even told me that um, at, their, at their library, a promotion file had a picture of a thank you cupcake in it. I don't know. But, um, but just, again, like sort of, that may be a silly example of ways of kind of formalizing this collaborative work that we want to really, uh, to really push and to really foreground and to ennoble uh, people's participations um, in this. Uh, thanks, Paul. Um, uh, going back to uh, this question earlier, I was I was thinking about um, I, I work in a consortium now, five colleges, where collaboration is kind of the the thing that that we've been trying to do and trying to talk about. And um, I think we've talked with colleagues um, at conferences about our teaching practices for ages now, and we've shared ideas and we've shared uh, modules and in, in, uh, in formal and informal kinds of ways. And so I'm thinking about the examples that you uh, posted there, like, uh, like Brian's, Brian's course. And I wonder if, um, if you might have any uh, origin stories from these or, or from maybe your own collaborations where, um, where they start in these very kind of organic, natural sort of ways, um, resource independent, um, and, and then maybe the ways in which um, digital technologies can scaffold um, uh, the ways in which we grow those collaborations, uh, change the scope of the course, change the kinds of questions we're asking with our students. Um, if there are any sort of narratives there. Yeah, thanks, Jake. Um, for me, it starts with envy, just flat out envy. Like, that is awesome. I love that. I want to do that. Um, but uh, as well as you know, participating in the cycle of kind of mutually borrowing from and building on um, the practices that that come into view when you work, when you do work openly, when you do try to share 
um, these sorts of uh, these sorts of examples, um, um, and then sort of figuring out. Then I think crucially, well, that is cool, that is nifty, but but why why do I need to do that? And and, and, and let me re-emphasize this about about this topic, as um, it is really hard in some ways to figure out how to coordinate uh, any sort of distributed system, um, especially when there are uh, multiple rosters and multiple students um, who, are, who are not going to be enamored of the niftiness of just having more people that they have to work with, right? There needs to be a driving rationale for what you're, what you're doing. Um, so I, I think that is also uh, uh, a crucial in terms of how these things develop. Um, always sort of you know, subordinating the tool um, to, to the, uh, the particular goals you have for, uh, for students. Um, and then uh, the scaffolding along the way is, is incredibly crucial. Um, sort of uh, building for serendipity, right? Um, uh, building for openness, sort of structuring enough of the interactions where students feel comfortable taking risks. Um, and if you're inviting students into experimental digital pedagogy environments, which I'd love to do, uh, it is also imperative on me and of anyone to sort of, um, uh, ex I wouldn't say defend this necessarily, but to help make students comfortable in participating in, uh, in, this, in this kind of work. You should have heard me give them the hard sell uh, at this. You, know, you are part of a bleeding edge experiment. This is amazing, like, like this is cutting edge stuff. And, and, and to really get them excited about you know, being part of research. My students are excited that I get to go to a focus group? Wow, right? Like they shouldn't really be that excited. Um, we are providing pizza. Um, but uh, to, to make them partners in the, in the experience, um, but to help them be comfortable entering that into that very different relationship by, by structuring it through these sort of you know, specific technologies. Again, this sort of vertigo of, of, well, you can do so much. There are so many options for uh, working these, just really choosing and committing to some and, uh, and trying to document how that, how that works. So um, in some ways, my uh, current collaboration is, is very low tech, right? Uh, I mean, we are, we are living and dying on Google Docs. Um, and so far, you know, that, that, has, that has worked. Um, and now is the point at which we're sort of letting students go um, uh, uh, for a week to sort of create collaborative projects, three from NC State, three from UGA, a project manager for each, uh, to sort of say, okay, now that, now that we sort of modeled uh, these collaborations and ways that it might be affected, um, uh, it's, it's your turn. Um, here's enough structure where hopefully you're kind of comfortable enough just running with it. Um, but I, I expect to handle a few emails in the next week um, about how this is all going to go down. So, all right, I'm getting the signal that uh, uh, it's it's time for the rest of our. Uh, a very exciting lineup. Thank you all again for, uh, for listening. Uh, eager to talk with you more about this as, uh, as our conversations continue in the next couple of days. Thank you. Thank you.